Joining me right now in Cairo is NBC News Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent Richard Engel. Richard, yesterday, uh, King M or President Mubarak said, I'm going to use the police if this keeps up. What is he actually doing on his behalf against the protesters right now? There is an ongoing battle behind me in Tahrir Square, and it has been going back and forth with each side in this conflict, and there are clearly two sides right now gaining the upper hand. The protesters appear to be somewhat in the advantage right now. How we got to this, this morning there were thousands of protesters here gathered peacefully. Today wasn't supposed to be a big day of demonstrations. Many of the protesters were angry after President Mubarak did not leave the country yesterday, and they were planning a big march on Friday. The surprise was when thousands, which later became at least 10 to 15,000 pro-Mubarak supporters arrived, they arrived on horseback, they arrived with weapons, and made a surprise attack with rocks and stones and bricks charging the demonstrators in the square, at one stage encircling all of the demonstrators, closing off the main entrance. Everyone here believes that this was clearly government orchestrated. The Komubar demonstrators arrived almost at the same time. They had very similar ba uh, similar uh, slogans that they were and banners that they were carrying. They were using at one stage military tactics to seal off the key choke points. But the protesters, all, after almost losing this square, have managed to fight back. And if you look behind me, you can see there is a lot of fire. The Tahrir Square extends back behind me almost as far as you can see. The pro-Mubarak demonstrators, who are now just in this area by the bridge, at one stage had reached to the middle of Tahrir Square. Then demonstrators brought in reinforcements and pushed them back again. They are using barricades, metal sheets, to in, that they're interlocking, almost like the Roman legions use shields as they march forward and then now launch Molotov cocktails back at each other. Richard, it's late at night over there. Do you expect this to go through the night for the first time, this conflict uh, in the streets? It seems that way. The protesters and protest leaders we've spoken to think this is it. They told they told NBC News they are willing to fight to the death, and they believe that they give up this movement that Mubarak has effectively won. They are convinced that Mubarak has that this is the crackdown against them by other means so that the government wouldn't have to provoke uh, international repercussions by sending in uniformed soldiers and tanks, instead sent in 10 to 15,000 irregulars, the same kind of people that Mubarak has used in the past, and, and I've seen this done before, to stuff ballot boxes and intimidate political candidates, now fighting to keep Mubarak in office. Let me ask you about the, uh, the political makeup of the crowd. Has there been any signal sent from the organizers of the protest as to their political makeup? The, I've met with a lot of the different protest leaders. They, they do involve the Muslim Brotherhood. And no doubt, the more violent it gets, the more influence you're going to see from groups like the Muslim Brotherhood, not necessarily the, the students and the activists who are uh, the intellectuals and, uh, and the elites who were initially organizing this. But it has largely been, until now, a secular movement. I can't guarantee it'll stay that way, especially yeah. if there are a lot of people killed tonight. People could reach down into their into their faith to, to keep them going. And we have been hearing, hearing quite a few shouts of Allah Akbar. But the protesters, including the Muslim Brotherhood, say they want a new election. They want Mubarak out of the country, and they want a parliamentary system. And whoever emerges on top of the of that parliamentary system will become the prime minister. They want to reduce the powers of the presidency. They want a, a, a normal parliamentary democracy like uh, like almost every European country has. Richard, how long do you think this can continue economically with the shops closed, with supplies running out? How long can the city of Cairo survive without the army cracking and saying, this can't go on another day? It could go on uh, at least for several more days. I don't know exactly what that is. That was the loudest explosion we've heard so far. We've been hearing uh, gunfire sporadic throughout this, but it could last a few more days. Protesters say even if they lose tonight, and at this stage, it doesn't look like they are going to lose, uh, 
I was just checking at the uh, the tanks because there are tanks uh, positioned around the perimeter of the square, and I thought at one stage the tanks might be mobilized. That is something we are watching for. Uh, at this stage, the tanks have not gone in to try and disrupt the situation. The protesters say even if they lose tonight, they will start again tomorrow. They will, might not go to Tahrir. They are talking about uh, gathering in another place, potentially marching on the presidential palace. And if tomorrow doesn't work, they say they have plans to start from mosques once again on Friday. So what happens here tonight will be a turning point. But even if the protesters lose, it probably will not be over. This city still does have basic supplies. There is food. There is water. Obviously, it's been devastating for the economy, which has been completely okay. paralyzed by, by, by all of this. But basic supplies are enough to sustain this are still are still in abundance. Richard Anger, you're the best. Take care of yourself right there. I've been getting reports about other journalists who've been roughed up. Take care until we see you again. Joining us right now, uh, the protests in Egypt, of course, have sent Arab leaders scrambling to institute preempt preemptive reforms aimed at pacifying the kind of arrest we're seeing in the streets of Cairo. Jordan's King Abdullah fired his entire cabinet and replaced his prime minister this week. Yemen's president said today he'd leave office before his term ends in 2013 and he'd remove his son as his likely successor. The Palestinian Authority announced it would schedule long-promised municipal elections. Syrian President Bashar Assad said he'd push through political reforms to establish municipal elections and a new media law. And the government of Sudan announced a dialogue with political parties. Joining me right now is Her Majesty Queen Noor of Jordan. She's the chairperson of the King Hussein Foundation. Queen Noor, thank you so much for coming over to Hardball today. Yes. I've known you a while. I'm very impressed by what you, your vision about this part of the world. You're born in America. You were a, a royal over there. Uh, do you think that this is a true democratic revolt we're seeing here, or is this really a Islamic Islamist move like we've seen in Iran and other countries? I think clearly what we're seeing is a popular uprising, and uh, it, it, the, the um, aspirations of those who are protesting have been made very clear for uh, freedom, for opportunity, for uh, jobs. In other words, they, they're asking for their social economic and political rights and, and, and opportunities. And, and this, is, this is a popular uprising, as Richard Engel just said and so many others. Those people represent many different sectors of society. Well, not to dra drag you into my fight, but we have a competitor on the air, Glenn Beck, who's saying this is the beginning of the caliphate. It's going to extend through Europe, all around the world, even majority Christian countries. They're all going to be taken over by the Islamists. Uh, is this a, is there a reason for that kind of alarm right now at this point? No, there, I, I don't think there is. A Glenn Beck's approach appears to be that kind of zero sum approach to to looking at the world that, in, in a way, we're seeing a protest against now. The the the, the reason that there is so much uh, tension in in the region at large is that uh, traditionally most of these regimes have actually uh, not allowed for uh, that uh, political space for political parties. Civil society institutions and others with different points right. of view can you see this participate. happening can you be instead, are you optimistic instead that leads to two extremes you sound optimistic uh, i'm very optimistic because i have faith in in the in in the people who have been um, out there peacefully asking for their rights and uh, i have enormous faith that uh, in in countries like egypt you have a, a good example in Turkey uh, and others that w we can see a coalition of <clears throat> different parties, different points of view, working together in a participatory okay. and consensual form of governance, which is all that these people okay, are Okay, let's talk. Uh, take off your Middle East hat, put on your American hat, uh, and you're born American. Arab American. Arab American. Proud of it. Well, of course. <laughs> but let me ask you about our president. It seems to me he's trying to figure this out. People have criticized Obama for being slow to the party. He never pushed democracy hard like the neocon did before. I didn't like their policy because it meant war over there. But the principle was, as you were suggesting, the Middle East could have some kind of parliamentary democracy. What should we be doing to encourage the good guys, from our perspective, the peaceful people, to win this fight once the king, once uh, Mubarak leaves? Well, it, I think it's telling if you look at where U.S. aid and uh, has been um, f targeted in, in the region at large. M m much of the U.S. aid into countries like Egypt and others is uh, ends up being military aid. And you don't have the same proportion or what should be a greater proportion going into people the human security needs of a country. Again, building civil society, building those institutions that can help 
create a, a, a space for many different yeah. points of view to work together in a participatory decision making. Yeah. Uh, you know, participatory decision making, consensus building, is actually an Arab and Islamic tradition that goes back many, many, many hundreds of years to the beginning, the beginnings of Islam. The, these are our traditions. Okay, of give governance. me an example of a good Arab country that knows how to do it. Jordan, it's pretty peaceful. We, is it democratic? It's no, more demo no, it's not democratic. No, exactly. But, and we have had, you know, various periods. The king has called for reforms now. He's changed the government. These were necessary decisions to take. And we have uh, plans that have been developed in the past for a reform process, a gradual reform process over time. And perhaps they can now start to implement will that. Will this kill, will this, will this stir, we, I went through the list, Jordan, Yemen, different kinds of countries, the West Bank, the Palestinian Authority, Syria, a Ba'athist government, a Sudan, I'm not sure what you'd call that. Are these countries watching this like we watched it on television yes. and thinking about things that will really matter and will keep God their willing. countries from going radical? God willing, they are. God willing, that will be the positive outcome of what we're seeing, which is the, the status quo was unsustainable for many right. years. We're now seeing all of these countries okay. uh, making similar commitments or regimes making a variety of commitments that have, have long been overdue. You know the Arab Human Development Reports that came out in 2002, 2003, 4, and 5, which were drawn together by Arab, credible Arab um, non-officials. These were um, intellectuals okay. and, and yeah. experts in a variety of areas, emphasizing the need in the Arab world for improved education, for um, improved uh, access okay. to opportunities for women for freedoms okay. and for job opportunities. Can I ask you a blunt question? Yes. Should we have been pushing harder 10 years ago for Mubarak to leave? I, I don't want to, I'm not going to get into that, but you, I think, could have been doing a great deal more to build up civil okay. society institutions throughout the region and laying emphasis okay. there, supporting, not dictating. Well, we're always late to the game. Thank you, Your Majesty Queen Thank North. You. Thanks for coming over to Hardball.